Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Uh, we're starting a new series today. It's kind of like a soft launch to it because I'll get into more of what the series is about uh, next week because today we're focusing on lives who have crossed this bridge to God. So our first message is the bridge to God. And we're going to talk about building bridges for the next few weeks. And the most important bridge you'll ever cross today is the one that leads to God. Now, I don't know if any of you like bridges or not. Anyone not like bridges in here? And I don't want to raise any anxieties or anything like that. But you may not know this, but Pastor John, our kid's pastor, he can't stand them. But he's been trying to overcome them. And he goes over them. We make, we make him go over them. And we, go, we take him to the side railing part, to the very edge. We roll the windows down. No, I'm just joking. We don't do all that. <laughs> we shake the car at the same time. No. Now, the first bridge that I actually got scared on was the one that my mom and dad took me on, the, the famous Chesapeake Bay Bridge slash tunnel. Wow. It's like if a bridge isn't bad enough, let's go underwater for miles, you know. And all you can think about is this water could crush me. There is no... Bridge that's easy to cross for those who are nervous about them. But there is a bridge, as I said before, that is so important that we cross in our lives. And it's the bridge to God. It's real. It's more spiritual. I'm using a bridge, a physical bridge as an analogy for a spiritual bridge. And it's relational. Now, here's the thing. When God created Adam and Eve... He intended to be in perfect relationship with him. But unfortunately, they chose to disobey God and sin entered the world through that one man, Adam and Eve, and it affected all of us. And because of God being holy and we allowed sin to enter into the world, we brought sin into the world, he had to separate himself from us. And to show that, he literally had Adam and Eve leave the perfect garden of Eden because of what they had done. It didn't mean that he didn't love them. He continued to love his creation. For years, he continued to show. For centuries, he continued to show his love and faithfulness and his grace and mercy to mankind, to us. We continue to mess up. If you read the Old Testament, it's a big book. It's a big part of the Bible. It's important that we read that historical part of our of our background as believers and, and the people of God and his creation, it's important that we read those, those long books in the Old Testament because you will find that we kept messing up. But yet God kept loving us. And to fix this separation and to, to make us uh, be able to have a relationship, to allow us to be able to have that relationship with him again, he built a bridge. And that bridge he gave us was Jesus Christ. And so you come into the New Testament and we find that God came to earth in Jesus to bring us back home with him. I want to show you God's love for you. I want to show you his mercy and grace for you by going to Luke chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 15. You can use your phones as well. I'm using the New Living Translation, and I want you to see that how this bridge is open, how this relationship with God can be found, because it's literally, in this story, we see that God, in these stories, God shows you he is there calling you home. He was there among them, and he's still calling us home. And it's chapter 15 of Luke, verse 1. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus. I'm going to stop right there for a moment and just share with you how profound that is. Notice who came 
to listen to Jesus. Sinners. You know what that means? Is that Jesus is approachable. That means that we, as believers, must be a place where someone can come and, and hear what we have to say and find a loving heart ready to share the truth in love. So we keep reading. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. To them... This was despicable because if you were around sinners like tax collectors, the reason why tax collectors were so hated is because they were the Jews. They were Jewish men and women or Jewish men who would literally work for Rome, which these Jewish priests were against that, and they would overcharge for their own benefit. So they were despicable to these teachers. And yet that's exactly who Jesus was trying to reach and love. And so they don't like this. And if they get around these kind of people, it's like they've been contaminated. And so that's how they feel about sinners. So Jesus has to kind of confront them in a loving way and tell them, and he does it through three stories, which are called parables, that teach you a lesson. So these three parables are key for us to understand how God feels about you and I as sinners. Verse 4 says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Praise God. Amen. It's a good thing to repent. It's a good thing to return to God, your creator, the one who made you. It's a good thing to escape the punishment of sin, which is hell and eternal damnation. It's a good thing. He goes on to say this, and he, he's, he's confronting them going, why aren't we celebrating? Verse 8, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. So we have here two stories that help you see the concern that God has for the lost. That he really, really cares that they are back home with him so much that he's willing to leave those who are good, those who have believed in Christ, those who are okay now, they've crossed that bridge, and now he is going to them who are lost. And he's showing them that when these people return, repent, okay, turn away from that lifestyle and turn back to God, turn away from the world and turn back to him, it's worth celebrating. But what we need to see here the most is, is that this is who Jesus came for. He came not for those who don't need a doctor, as he says in Luke chapter 5 earlier on, but those who realize they are sick, those who realize they are sinners and need help. That's why he came. And they're missing it. These Pharisees and, and religious teachers who know the Bible, the Old Testament, inside and out, they've missed it. And they don't believe Jesus is the one who's come to save mankind. So that's why they've rejected Jesus. And that's also why they've rejected all those who are sinful. It's kind of sad. And Jesus is using these, par these parables to really show them what what he's all about and reveal to them what they are about. But he doesn't stop there. He shares one of the most powerful stories in the Bible you will ever read. It's about a father who has two sons and the father represents God and one son represents a sinner who runs away from the father, the house, and then the other one who stays home, which he's referring to as these Pharisees. So he's not done addressing them. This is what verse 11 says in Luke 15. 
To illustrate the point further, Jesus told him the story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Now, just so you understand something, in this culture at this time, to say that you wanted your father's estate was to literally say that I want you dead. Because you would not receive that until your father was dead. And if the father wanted to give it earlier, he would initiate that process first if he was alive. You would never come and ask for that. And to do that, the entire community would be like, whoa, that guy is a jerk. That son is off. No one would be like welcoming him home at all. So it goes on to say, so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. By the way, the word prodigal comes from the word in the Greek, wasted. So that's what it means to be a wasteful, a wasteful son. Verse 14, about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. It's like 2020 for him. He didn't plan for that, though. And here's the thing. There's a, there's a lesson in that. We don't plan for those kind of things to happen. And when we're all on our own or we don't know what to do, it can humble us. That famine was, was humbling this man. And it reminds me of the story of, of building your life on the rock of Christ, not the sand. So when the life storms come and life hits you, you're still standing. Well, this, this young man he discovered that without Christ, he's in trouble. Without his father, he's in trouble. Because life is going to, and by the way, this is what we typically do. We run away, and when things go bad, we typically blame God. But we made that choice. And even if we are believers and in the house of God, by the way, life isn't perfect. We're still going to go through stuff, but at least the father's there. At least we're close to the father to trust him. It gets pretty bad, though, in verse 15. He's persuaded, he persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. So it's pretty bad. And verse 17 says, when he finally came to his senses, when he finally realized what he had done, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare and here I am dying of hunger I will go home to my father and say father I have sinned against both heaven and you I'm no longer worthy of being called your son please take me on as a hired servant so he returned home to his father now I want you to see God's love real quick here in the scripture because what we are used to in our society is that when you go and do something this wrong to a family member, when you go and do this, this wrong to a friend, usually we get ghosted, which means ignored. We get the hand, maybe some of you guys remember that from like 1990 something. I don't know, maybe it was early 20s. It's, it's 2020 now, it's crazy. In other words, we get shunned. This is what God is like for those who come back home. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Do you know what that means, my friends, right now? God was looking out on the horizon, looking for the frame of his son every day, saying, I hope he comes home. I want him home. That's how God feels about you. Whether you've walked away or you've never been with God yet, he's hoping you will come home. He's looking for you. He's adamantly looking for you. He's relentlessly looking for you to come. Sometimes we read right over that and don't miss how he was looking. And then here's what's amazing too. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. He didn't wait for his son to show up. He ran to him embraced him and kissed him 
And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. And the father doesn't let him finish what he rehearsed because what he rehearsed in verse 19 is, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as your hired servant. God or the father in the story doesn't let him even finish that sentence. And he says, this is what happens. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son, not servant, this son of mine, was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Wow. That's why we're celebrating today. Amen. Praise God. If I go home, I'll be a hired servant. At least I can get some food. No. God wants you to be in his house because you're his child. He created you to be with him. Sin and the devil, just jacking everything up. We, we, have, we, have to, we have to take ownership for what we do. One of, the, one of the worst things I'm seeing in our world right now is we don't take ownership for our issues. <laughs> the reason why the good news is also really humbling is because you have to admit that you've messed up. We have to admit that. I did. And I continue to mess up, especially, um, and I continue to admit that with my wife. Because <laughs> she sees me more than anyone else and my kids. It's a humbling experience to go, yeah. Think about that. That was a humbling experience for the son to go, oh, man, I wasted it. I messed up. I, I don't even know if I would go home. And, and, and oh, you know what? Mm hmm. Yeah. There's some people here today that won't even come back to God. Maybe you're online and you don't think you can come back to God. You're afraid to, you're ashamed of what you've done. I got news for you. God's waiting with his arms wide open. I got news for you. Praise God. There's a song that says sin is great, but God is greater. His love is greater than our great sin. Come home. Today, come home. God's, God's calling people home today. The reason why we're doing this now is because we're going to be doing another water baptism for the day that everyone gave their life to Christ today. Everyone who came home, we're going to do another water baptism for all of you and our friends that we tell this good news to. But here's the thing. Jesus was confronting some people who didn't want these sinners to be saved. They weren't thinking about their salvation. They were thinking about their own, their own spiritual pride. So he's not done. And now he brings in the other son to the story. And he's trying to show them that you're concerned about yourself instead of concerned for the lost. Church, we need to be concerned for the lost. Church, we got to quit worrying about the little petty things that's going on in our world or inside of a church building on Sunday mornings or yada, yada, yada. I don't know. My goodness. We have people that don't have Christ. They're far from him. Amen. We need to talk about that. Amen. We need to talk about that. This is what comes next in verse 28. The older brother representing the Pharisees and those who are upset at Jesus it says the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And all that time, you never gave me even one goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on, he assumes prostitutes. He doesn't have any idea. He hasn't talked to his brother yet. You celebrate by killing the fattened calf. The fattened calf was the calf everyone wants to come hang out and eat at that house. So some big steaks. Okay, some 24 ounces. 
I think that's big. His father said to him, look, and he also says son as well. Dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Church, I want you to see this. Jesus left his house again to go after the older brother to say, come on in. The reason being is these Pharisees were also sinners. We miss that sometimes. They didn't realize they needed Jesus too. We must be careful in the church that we make sure our hearts are right with God. And our love for this lost world needs to increase. And an important bridge to build right now in our world is that we're approachable. That people will be willing to come talk to us, to sit at Jesus' feet, well, to sit at our feet, because we're a little bridge to the most important bridge. Those side bridges to get to the bridge of Christ, Jesus, that's, we're important. It's important that we represent Jesus and the word of God properly. So Jesus crossed, this is an important takeaway, Jesus crossed the great divide of eternity to seek and to save us. Wow. Romans 5, 6 through 8. God built this bridge, okay? He built this bridge without us initiating. He did it. He sent Jesus down. Look at these scriptures. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. Like, I'll lay down my life for that person. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. He died for wicked people like us. The next scripture, 1 John 4, 9 through 10. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Real love is someone willing to sacrifice their life so you could have eternal life. You won't find any other religion that would teach that except ours, except Jesus Christ. And lastly, the bridge that I've been talking about, it's right here. Colossians 1, 19 through 22. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, or Emmanuel, God with us. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. Listen to this verse. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you, who were once far away from God. He's talking to people who have already believed and have crossed this bridge. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Ouch. But we need to realize that. That God will have to bring up some things in our lives and convict us of some things so we understand what we're being saved from. Yet now, verse 22, he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ and his physical body. As a result, he has brought you, I love this, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy or pure and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Now, this is hard for us to believe this because we see and hear and think things and we're like, oh, man, I, there's no way that God can look at me as holy and pure. Yes, because he sees Christ's blood over you for what we call the remission of sin, the forgiveness of sin, the covering over our sin. You are holy in God's eyes when you believe in Christ and accept what he's done for you. Believers who have been in the church forever and been following Jesus forever, you are holy in God's eyes. You are forgiven. The difference between someone who believes in God and someone who doesn't is the believer is forgiven, the other one doesn't yet realize they're forgiven, and therefore they still stand, as the word of God says in John 3, condemned until they believe. And 
Jesus is here on earth in this story of Luke 15 telling you, you don't have to stay away from God. He made a way to come home, and it's through me. You've been forgiven. You are loved. God loves you. Come home today. Come home. Right now online or in this room, I want you to know something really important. We couldn't pay the toll to cross that bridge. We couldn't afford it. We can't build our own bridge into eternal life and forgiveness. We can't. It's impossible. It has to be done by someone who is eternal. It has to be done by someone who is perfect and who can complete that task. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today, I'm calling you in this room today, if you do not have this relationship with God, he has already made a way for you to be in relationship with him. You can't work for it. You can't pay for it. You can't be good enough for it. Can you imagine, by the way, having to keep track of how many good things you did, how many bad things you did, and how would you know how many good things is enough? Do I have to do two million good things? Or, and then if does, does one bad thing cancel out all the good things I did because it's one bad thing? That's impossible. Jesus, it's so simple. The gospel is simple, but sometimes we make it so complicated. He did it all so that you could come home. He did the work. We just have to believe and receive it today, and you will be changed. The Holy Spirit that we sang about comes into your life and makes you a brand new person. He gives you the heart and the mind that would do what's right. And his grace helps you as you go through life and you're not perfect. His grace covers you. And what's amazing is his grace isn't a license to continue in sin. His grace is a license to grow to change, to mature, to help you. Thank God for that. So today, and, and believers who, have, who are firm in their faith and understand this, would you just begin to pray right now because the enemy does not want this to take place. And everyone around this room, if you don't mind, we're going to pray to God. Would you close your eyes? Would you bow your heads? Because today, you're hearing this great love for you. You're also hearing about sin, and it is real, and it is... The penalty of sin, the Bible says, is death, but the gift of eternal life comes through Jesus, and everyone is welcomed, because he did it for all, not just a few, not just some, he died for all. He's calling you home today, and in a minute, we're going to celebrate 27 lies that have crossed over from darkness into light from death to life. And they are about to identify and demonstrate their relationship with Christ, that they're willing to follow him in all circumstances. Jesus himself was water baptized, and then he commanded us to go and make disciples, followers of Christ, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded them. So even after you're baptized, you're not done growing. You continue to learn how to obey God. And we're about to celebrate that. And we're going to pray for them. But right now, I believe that God is using this message today to call people home. So before, between you and God and me, because I want to know who I'm praying for, if you're saying, I recognize my sin, and let me, let me actually do something. Let me pray real quick about this decision. God, I ask that you would move in this room, that you'd move online, that God, your, your love, your love will convict us of our wrongdoing so we can see how much we need you. So God, do that. And then help us to grasp and believe in your faith, your faithful son, Jesus, your love for us and believe in what he did for us on the cross in Jesus name. So right now in this room, if that's you, would you, would you raise your hand and say, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. I see him. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
You're saying, I'm sorry, I see my sin. Nine. Praise God. I'm coming home. Amen. Let's pray together right now. You can repeat after me. You can say this from your heart. Dear Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for my sin, for sending your son to die for my sin. I believe I'm forgiven. I believe in the risen Christ. I believe I have life after death for eternity. I receive this love and forgiveness and I dedicate my life to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Let's praise God right now. Praise you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.